How many of you remember your first visit to this campus? For me, despite having front row seats to watch Danny Ainge play on this very floor on my official recruiting trip, the most lasting memory I have was seeing the sign as we pulled up to campus, enter to learn, go forth to serve. As a 17-year-old, I didn't exactly know what that meant. But over the years, as I've returned to Provo, I always find myself looking at that sign and reminiscing about the first time I saw it, and then wondering if my life reflects that motto. That is the topic of my message this morning. Enter to learn, go forth to serve. For the record, let me state that I'm a work in progress. Like you, I am still learning. And although I had amazing athletic moments here, life-changing spiritual experiences, and was surrounded by great influences, regrettably, I did not take full advantage of the education. In short, I squandered many of my academic opportunities. But life is about second chances. Tonight, a member of our NBC10 family is celebrating a very special milestone. 16 years ago, Vi Sikahema left college to pursue a career in the NFL, a very successful career. Of course, Vi achieved success there in the field, later in broadcasting, but he left his academic life just a few credits short of his degree. Vi's fulfilled a promise to himself and his family by going back to college and getting his diploma, and we've asked him to share a few of those moments with us. Yeah, this makes me the uh, ultimate return man, I think. Uh, for, the, for the past few years, I've been taking my uh, three sons to Utah for a little father and son weekend outing that included taking in a BYU football game. Well, two years ago, as we strolled through campus on our way to the game, my oldest son, Landon, asked me why I never graduated. Well, after hemming and hawing for a little while, I simply promised him that I'd finished my last two classes and that we'd all return as a family for my graduation. Well, through this school year, I took those two classes and I passed. And then this weekend, I made good on that promise to my kids. Okay, okay, good, good. Okay, one, two, good. I'm graduating with a bunch of kids here that weren't even born when I came to BYU. <laughs> oh, that looks great, great. Good, good job, thank you. Oh, President, how are you? How are you, brother? Good to see nice you. Nice to see you. How are you? Vi is one of the great football players that ever played here. He played in the 80s under Lavelle. He was our kick return specialist. I'm thinking to myself, had I graduated on time 16 years ago, I don't think I'd be at this reception, so. <laughs> but there is a special graduate today, Vi Sikahema one of our more illustrious students from the 1980s. He will receive a degree today. We remember him as one of the greatest kickoff return men in the history of Brigham Young University. He is maintaining the tradition of being one of BYU's greatest return specialists. chapters in our lives that we wish we could go back and redo. This was one of them for me. My oldest son is a sophomore in high school, so he's a couple years away from college. Proud of me? Um, I wanted to have some credibility when I would encourage him and tell him that he needed to go to college. I needed to have the credibility of a college degree to be able to do that and say that. The war that we attend back east is known by some in our stake as the BYU football war. We may have earned that name because a few years ago I was the bishop, but it was mostly because all of the former Cougars who have played for the Philadelphia Eagles since the 1990s have lived in our ward. Having professional athletes in our ward created some rather interesting situations. For instance, as a former player myself, I knew the one thing I missed most during the football season was attending sacrament meetings with my family. So accordingly, I gave permission to our NFL players to have their own sacrament meetings, which they held on Saturday nights with their families. On the rare occasions, uh, on the rare Sundays when they were playing a home Monday night game or if it was a bye week and they were able to attend our services, I always encouraged our players to join our deacons in passing the sacrament or bless with the priests. 
It was always rather interesting to see our deacons, some no taller than five feet, standing side by side with Eagles all pro tight end Chad Lewis, who is six foot six. I, always, I also noticed that when Eagle running back Reno Maha visited the ward, some of our priests were just as tall, and a few claimed they towered over Brother Mahe. <laughs> Not only were the boys ecstatic to officiate with an NFL star, but the players got to perform the priesthood ordinances that they missed so much during the NFL season. Of course, because of the nature of our jobs, my association with my players in the ward was sometimes awkward. After all, I was their bishop, but I was also a member of the Philadelphia media that covered their every move on a daily basis. This is the Ty Detmer family, along with my wife and my son Landon, whom you've met. Once I interviewed Ty and his wife Kim for Temple Recommends on a Sunday night, and 24 hours later, I was interviewing him in front of his locker after a tough outing against the San Francisco 49ers on Monday night football. Now think about the paradox of that. I'm his bishop, and one night I'm asking the most probing, intimate questions, very confidential, completely personal, and the very next night, I have to grill him publicly on TV for throwing three interceptions in front of a national audience, two of them in the fourth quarter. We were probably five or six deep around his locker with notepads, microphones, and cameras rolling when I started the interrogation. Ty, I said, the coach pulled you from the game in the fourth quarter after throwing your third interception, which I might add was thrown into double coverage. Can you walk me through your progression and tell me what were you thinking when you threw that ball? A hundred local and national media members were hanging on every word, and Ty looked at me with a crooked grin and says in that slow Texas drawl, Ah, oh, Bishop, I made a mistake. Will you, for <laughs> Will you forgive me? One other interview was rather memorable. When Chad Lewis arrived in Philadelphia, the local media was enamored to learn that Chad speaks fluent Mandarin Chinese, having served his mission in Taiwan. Being a curious lot, one day a member of the media corps wanted to hear what Chinese sounds like from a six-foot-six red-headed Yutan. Chad was asked to speak the language of his mission, and he politely obliged as the news cameras rolled. And it sounded rather eloquent. But once everybody got their sound bite, they packed up their gear and headed out the door to their various stations to file their report for that evening's broadcasts. One problem, no one bothered asking Chad to translate what he said. I only realized what he had said when my phone lines lit up at the station from members of the Asian branch in South Philadelphia. Messages on my voicemail claimed that they heard Chad Lewis on TV reciting in their native tongue the fourth section of the Doctrine and Covenants. <laughs> Chad confirmed he did exactly that when he told me it was the first thing that came to his mind. <laughs> Don't think NFL executives haven't capitalized on Chad's ability to speak Chinese. It is a sports and television market with unlimited potential that the NBA and the NFL desperately want to penetrate. I thought Chad's involvement in the NFL's effort was worth sharing with our viewers. But more importantly, I wanted our viewers to know why Chad speaks Chinese. NFL football is the most popular sport in the U.S. And they're turning to the Eagles' Chad Lewis to help them extend their reach to China. Vi has more about what that's all about. Yeah, this is just a great story. Uh, the NBA is hugely popular in China because of the Houston Rockets' Yao Ming. And the NFL would love to tap that market. but. Hey, they've got no Yao Ming. So they're turning to the Eagles all-pro tight end Chad Lewis, the only NFL player who speaks fluent Mandarin Chinese. He went to BYU, and his mission was to China. Fluent Mandarin Chinese, Chris. How about that? Hi, i Lu Guowei. NFL Films is producing a series of football shows for mainland China that Lewis will host. <laughs> that was uh, impressive, man. <laughs> that took me like wow. two hours last time. How was that, huh? It was excellent. She. Excellent. <laughs> was it smooth? Excellent. Was it good? Good. You understood what he said? Every word. <laughs> <laughs> You're impressed? I'm very impressed with his Chinese. Because he hasn't been there. 
only he only you know been staying in Taiwan for two years. Two years. And uh, also Chinese is a very difficult language. American football is not only in America. Yeah. Maybe someday it will be in China. Yeah. It is not a game of American people, but maybe someday it's a game of Chinese people. A billion people in 300 million homes. Sir Iran. Yeah. Sir Iran. He'll be a big star in China. Yeah. Yeah. Help me with this. Kelly Su Di An O K O K Y. Kelly Su Di An O K Y. Okay. To me, it's like a picture. I can look at the Mona Lisa, and I can say, well, yeah, that's the Mona Lisa. But then I can't. I can't draw it myself, you know, I can't paint it. And that, and characters is like that for me. Mandarin Chinese became Lewis's primary language for two years while serving as a Mormon missionary in Taiwan in the early 90s. They treat you with a lot of honor and respect and dignity and um, I, just, I just learned to love them, which was a great thing for me. I hope you can find your country in It, 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 it's really, it really is amazing. I'm amazed watching him do it. A couple years ago, the NFL took him. In fact, he's going again at the end of the football season. Took him to China, where he held all of the press conferences in Chinese. And the people amazing. were just amazed that he I could speak to way. them in their native tongue. All right, so now he gets in the huddle. He starts talking Mandarin That's Chinese. Right. Donovan's That's, like, wow. All the audibles. <laughs> they should do all the audibles in Chinese. Nobody will know what's going on. Fascinating Thanks. story. A great story? Fascinating story. Yeah, all right. Yes. Great. Okay. Thanks, bye. Chad actually worked for Chinese TV as an analyst during the Super Bowl. When I asked him how it went, he told me it was fine, except he didn't have a football vocabulary. So he said things like, I testify that the quarterback's throw was true. <laughs> when China is open someday to missionary work, they may recognize the language of the gospel, partly because of Chad's broadcasts. Speaking of languages, during the Salt Lake Winter Games, hundreds of requests were made by the media for access to the missionary training center. All of them denied. Understandably, the brethren did not want our missionaries distracted. Still, I petitioned my former public relations professor, Bruce Olson, who's now the managing director of church public affairs, for me to do a story on missionaries coming to the Philadelphia mission, as well as Philadelphia area missionaries headed to other parts of the world. I was pleasantly surprised when permission was granted. But most of you folks know the Church of Jesus Christ of Latter-day Saints is a big presence here. And in fact, the Salt Lake City uh, Games called upon many of its members for the volunteer effort because so many of its members speak a second language. And they do that because of the uh, missionary efforts of the church. They send young men and young women all over the world and they teach them those languages, 46 in all, right here in Provo, Utah. Corey Jenkins isn't Russian. He's from Mesa, Arizona. <laughs> Corey volunteers as an interpreter for the Salt Lake City Games. Like a guide. Um, we show them what they want to see. Um, we're happy to help and to do whatever they need. Um, if they have any questions, we, if we don't know the answer, we, could, we know how to find the answer. <laughs> About a quarter of the interpreters at these games learn to speak their language here at the Missionary Training Center in Provo, Utah. Susan Kim was born in Philadelphia to Korean parents and is headed to her native land, but still needs to polish her Korean. I'm learning how to um, speak properly speak very formally and respectfully. That's part of the reason I'm excited to be able to learn someone else's culture and to be able to love the people in there and to learn about who they are and um, about their history. When they come back, almost without exception, there'll be many ambassadors for that area. And you better not say anything bad about their people and their language because they'll defend them. These guys are Philly bound, so I provided the language training. This is the most basic one. How you's doing? How you's doing? How you's doing? You guys not bad. Uh, <laughs> okay. and no, 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 it's not what's up. It's yo. Yo, yo. 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 Ah. Okay. You guys got that. I think you guys are ready for Philadelphia. Okay. Yeah, right. Sounds like okay. Yeah. That's right. Those guys will be arriving in Philadelphia in a couple of weeks. Did you tell them about pretzels? Uh, they know all about the pretzels. I filled them in on the pretzels. And in the interest of full disclosure, I went through that missionary training center 20 years ago, but they sent me to South Dakota. Yeah. When I retired from football and hired by my station, I was assigned as sports anchor on the weekends. Two years into my new career, I was promoted from weekends to be the lead sports anchor. 
two months after this promotion, our bishopric was reorganized and our new bishop called me as his first counselor. That was great, except the bishop was moving in four months and his home was already on the market. With each passing week, I was resisting the presumptuous notion that I might be the next bishop. About this time, my prayers were increasingly fervent. I did what many of us do and were desperate. I attempted to dictate to the Lord what I thought was best for me. If this call was coming, and it seemed to be, I couldn't think of a worse time to be called as a bishop in my ward. I was a young father trying to balance family obligations with a demanding job in a new career that often required me to travel, usually on weekends, covering Philadelphia's four major sports teams. I had just been promoted from weekend anchor to sports director. It was a plum job in the fourth TV market in the country. My predecessor was 70 when I replaced him, and he had held the position through three decades. If there was such a thing as job security in our business, this was it, and I did not want to jeopardize it. And in my mind, a call as a bishop might do just that. And then one morning, one Saturday morning, while in the Washington, D.C. temple with my wife, something remarkable happened. While wrestling with these issues, a calm and a peace washed over me. Stephen Covey would call my experience a paradigm shift. Suddenly it occurred to me that I had it backwards. I had been praying for weeks, pleading with the Lord to spare me of this call because of my new promotion. A strong impression came that I was being promoted so that I could be the bishop. It seemed so simple, and yet I hadn't seen it because my mind was clouded in dictating to the Lord why I shouldn't be bishop. But once I accepted that, I felt the peace that the Lord would work out the details and the minutiae of my schedule, including weekend travel. The Lord revealed to me that day that I would indeed be the bishop of our ward, and the feeling was serene. The serenity was followed by a succession of ideas that I wrote on the back of someone's business card taken from my wallet, and I wrote them down as the thoughts came. First, the Spirit prompted me to advise my general manager and news director that this call was imminent and to prepare them for it. Secondly, I felt inspired to bear my testimony to them. They needed to know how important this call was to me, my family, the church, and the Lord. Finally, I had the distinct impression to invite them to the sacrament meeting in which I would be called and sustained. A few days after this temple experience, our stake president called us and asked to see us. Two weeks after that meeting, I was sustained and set apart as the bishop of our ward. In the intervening week of receiving the call from the stake president and my ordination, I made an appointment to see my GM and my news director together. At our meeting, we exchanged a few pleasantries, and then I told them of my new calling and explained how significant this was to me. And then I bore my testimony to them that this was a calling of God, and serving Him was my intent. My news director asked what kind of time commitment this meant for me, and was this a permanent position? I told him typically bishops serve from five to eight years. And then I explained that Monday nights I will go home, as I always have, between our 6 and our 11 o'clock broadcasts for family night. But in addition, I wanted to be at the church on Tuesday nights for our youth programs, and Wednesday nights for interviews with our members. Thursday nights I would be with our missionaries, auxiliary leaders, and my counselors to visit investigators, part member families, and inactives. Ideally, I wanted to be home on Sundays to preside over our meetings. And then an amazing thing happened. The GM looked at me and asked, Vi, what can we do to help you? Emboldened, I said, Sir, to the extent you can allow me to perform my obligations to the Lord and to my church, I will move heaven and earth so that my professional duties won't be shortchanged. Following the impression I had received in the temple, I told them that my congregation was sustaining me that next Sunday. Then following our services, men with priesthood authority will lay hands on my head and ordain me to my new calling. I sheepishly asked if they would like to be there. Their response was simply, we didn't think you'd ask. We'd be honored. My GM and news director came with their families, as did a handful of others from my work whom I'd invited. Their presence at our sacrament meeting and at my ordination, I believe, facilitated some rather unique and unprecedented solutions to my holy calling. Together we mapped out a strategy that required hiring a part-time producer to research and to write my scripts so that I could go home and administer to my ward. My GM simply said, carry your cell phone in case of emergencies or breaking news, otherwise take care of your church obligations 
and just be in the studio no later than a half hour before airtime. Secondly, I was relieved of having to travel on weekends to cover games. That duty was given to our young sports reporter who was more than thrilled. I would not be required to travel until our teams made it to the playoffs. But the last concession may have been the most inspired. My superiors were so amazed with my commitment to the church that they actually encouraged me to tell our viewers about my calling and to share unique experiences I'd have as a bishop that might be relevant to our viewing public. You are watching NBC 10 News at 4. There are some special people who are moved to a higher calling. Vi Sikahem is one of those people, and today he shares a very personal experience he had this week. Vi, you've told us a lot about going to New York, why you were at Ground Zero, but a lot of folks don't know that this is something that you do all the time. This just happened to be a special mission for you. Yeah, I, I, I should clarify and say that I don't do this all the time, mm -hmm. but I do as uh, part of my, in my role as, uh, as a bishop in the church. Um, Council families and council people in spiritual sp spiritual matters, but this was a completely different. Uh, most of you probably think of me as a former football player and a newscaster, but after I put away my helmet and my pads, I got a lot more involved in my church. In 1997, I was ordained a bishop in the Church of Jesus Christ of Latter Day Saints, and when you're called on to do God's work, you don't really know exactly where that's going to lead you sometimes. And this week, it took me in a journey to Ground Zero. There is something about Vi Sikahema many of you may not know. He is a bishop in the Church of Jesus Christ of Latter-day Saints. This week, his church work took him to ground zero with two other religious workers from Philadelphia. Now, we asked Vi if we could go along with a camera. He allowed us to share part of the experience with him. We're members of the Chapel of Four Chaplains. It's a non-denominational group, and we help people. Eventually, we'll be counseling recovery workers. Today, we're figuring out the best way to set up our operation. Good morning. Everyone gets checked over by police before we can go into the red zone. That's the area right around ground zero. Where the cranes are is where the towers used to be, and that's where the work is going on right now. It's a heavily secured area and very noisy. This is where we find out more about the work we'll be doing. Recovery workers are constantly coming in and out of these tents for something to eat and drink. Maybe someone to talk to, and we'll be going out to them as well. Just off the harbor here, we're on the south side of, uh, of the World Trade Center, and there's a little memorial here that they've set up for the families. You can see flowers and teddy bears that they've set up here for people to come and pay their respects to their loved ones and those who've been lost. And that is a poignant note right there from a little boy, Dad, I love you, Anthony. And these flowers look uh, fresh yeah. still, so he probably came just recently in the last couple of days. On the way home, it all starts to sink in. I guess the thing that got me most unglued was when the families passed by. Yeah. And uh, everybody just stopped and took off their hard hats and held them over their chest, and I just totally lost it at that point. Yeah. Well, for some of those family members that we saw, that was, that was probably the closure, that the, the most closure they're going to have with all this. Going to the site and paying their respects and leaving flowers, that, that was their closure, and that's, that's pretty sad. Hey, 25 years ago, Lake Worth was a popular picnic park in Lindenwall, New Jersey, but over the years, it became a victim of neglect and disrepair. That is until nearly 200 young people from all over South Jersey who belong to the Church of Jesus Christ of Latter-day Saints decided to challenge me for a special service project. Vi, we're the youth of the Cherry Hill Stake. And we challenge you to clean this park with us. Yeah. All right, let's do some work. Andy Reid has been practicing for his date tonight with a Mormon Tabernacle Choir. 
It is my great pleasure to introduce to you your coach, Andy Reid. The Eagles coach with an encore number of Fly Eagles Fly like you've never heard it before. Reed's wife, Tammy, sent the music to Salt Lake City months ago, and the world-famous choir performed it for their fellow Latter-day Saint tonight. Eagles head coach Andy Reed is, of course, the most prominent Latter-day Saint and BYU alum in Philly. I'm obviously not the only former Cougar in Philadelphia who entered BYU to learn and went forth to serve. A quarter century ago, Adam Haysbert and I were not only teammates, we were freshman roommates in Helaman Halls. He's best remembered for catching the game-winning touchdown pass against Pittsburgh in 1984 that catapulted us to the national championship. Today, Adam is a minister for a non-denominational church in one of the toughest parts of our area, the Germantown section of Philadelphia. Pastor Haysbert entered BYU to learn and went forth to serve. The positive influence of BYU graduates is not limited in the Philadelphia region to Christians. For the last four years, my friend Nisa Mornick has served the Jewish community of Wildwood, New Jersey as rabbi of Beth Judah Temple. Rabbi Wernick earned his doctorate at BYU with his dissertation on the Book of Abraham. He is an advocate and a friend for the church, has consistently defended the prophet Joseph Smith, the teachings of the Book of Mormon, and of course his specialty, the Pearl of Great Price. Recently, Rabbi Wernick even told me that he credits the honor code as the reason he quit a three-pack-a-day smoking habit. Rabbi Wernick, entered to learn and went forth to serve. Nearly 20 years ago, Sports Illustrated did a story on BYU players serving missions and sent a photographer to South Dakota where I was serving to spend a day and a half with me. He took pictures of us around the mission office. We were trying to act normal. <laughs> we were with the mission president in his office. We were jogging in the morning and then playing a little tennis on preparation day with my companion and mission president. President, those shorts would be uh, off limits here at BYU, I suspect. <laughs> the next day, the photographer wanted us to take him to some of the people we were teaching, and that's where he shot this photo. Robert Dull had just been added to our teaching pool the day before when we went to his family's sporting goods store, which was just a mile from the mission office, to buy tennis balls for the pictures that you just saw. These photos never made the SI profile, but Bob Dull is here. Bob, would you come up and join me? This is Bob Dahl. He is a mechanical engineer now, and he lives in Springville, Utah. Bob was working the cash register when my companion and I approached with our purchase. Bob, do you remember what you said to us when we uh, walked up to you? I do. Never met two guys named Elder before. <laughs> Seizing that opportunity, I said, sir, these, these titles allow us to carry the greatest message on earth. When can we come and share that with your family? We invited Vi to, to come to the home, and uh, we had two lessons together in my home. Uh, Jackie was, my wife Jackie was a little bit hesitant about the lessons, so we decided that we would, uh, we would meet at 6.30 in the morning in the back of the store. If you know me, I'm not a morning person. Thank you very much, Bob. It required special permission from the mission president because we weren't supposed to leave our apartments until 9.30, but he allowed us to leave at 6 o'clock to meet with Bob at 6.30 every morning. My companion snapped this picture in Bob's office after one of our early morning discussions. <laughs> For a couple of months, we taught Bob every morning at his office before he was baptized. And here's a photo of Bob's family around the time we were teaching him. We didn't have any luck with Jackie, as uh, Bob mentioned, but Bob baptized her sometime later along with his girls. Rachel is the older one in Bob's arm, and Aaron is the baby. And this is them about 12 years later when the girls were in their early teens, the day they were sealed as a family in the Dallas Temple. Here's a more recent picture, the two girls just outside of this building when Rachel graduated from BYU recently. Here's Bob, Jackie, Rachel, and the baby Aaron with Aaron's husband, Michael, who are here. They were recently married in the Billings Temple, and guess where Erin and her husband Michael go to school? All three have entered BYU to learn and are going forth to serve. Now, if you'll please excuse the Father's indulgence. You've already met my son Landon, who offered the invocation. He is planning for a mission after this his freshman year. But he's off to a great start. 
Before graduating from high school this summer, Landon challenged this man, whom we've taught, home taught for years, to hear the discussions before he left for college. The challenge was accepted, and this father and husband of a part member family rewarded Landon with the honor of performing his baptism. That's Landon's younger brother, Trey, who is now my home teaching companion since Landon left home to come to BYU. Landon is already entering to learn and going forth to serve. Like my friend Bob Dahl, I'm sure Landon's convert baptism will one day send his posterity to BYU where they will enter to learn and go forth to serve. President Hinckley once said, the university has brought much favorable notice to the church. Its sponsoring organization is widely recognized. It has become known for standards and ideals which have been written about and talked about and which have let the world know of those things in which we believe. Its academic programs and its athletic programs have both brought honor to the university and the church. And as generations of students move through its halls and on to graduation and then out across the world, they will bring honor to their alma mater and its sponsor, the Church of Jesus Christ of Latter-day Saints. I pray that we may recognize that more than just a motto, in a very real sense, it is a covenant. Enter to learn, go forth to serve. In the name of Jesus Christ, amen.